knowledge of the prehistoric world before the first historian sat down to write the story of his people is vague. It's founded on the research of archaeologists. Their studies of people and dwellings which existed in those times existed not only in rocky wastelands, but in the warmer climates, in lush prehistoric jungles. Not so very long ago, an explorer in a wild tropic jungle found evidence which told this story. Nobody knows when these events took place, maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000 years ago. It's the story of romance when the world was young. And as all romances must, it concerns itself mainly with one man, Angor, and one woman, Tigri. This is the woman of our story. She is Tigri, the leader of her tribe. Under the spell of the full moon, Tigri and the women of her tribe dance restlessly, savagely, impelled by a feeling of frustration, of a promise unfulfilled. They dance not knowing why and continue until exhausted. one tells them to be calm. This is Loti. This is Arva. This is Tigri. You've met her before. This is Tule. This is Eros. This is Nika. This is the wise one. Old as the moon and wise as the sun. She knows why the young ones dance so restlessly in the light of the full moon. She's telling them the story of the founding of their tribe. She explains that many moons ago, the tribe was founded by Tana, the mother of Tigri. In those days, the women were the slaves. And in Tana's tribe, as in all other tribes, no woman dared question the men. The men needed only to order, and the trembling women hastened to obey. She tells them that when they were small children, they lived deep in the jungle, the young ones of a band of jungle dwellers. This is Tigri's mother, Tana. She and the others have stopped for a momentary rest tired from carrying the carcass of a dead animal. The angry leader of the tribe comes back to find out why the women are falling behind. To him, weariness is no excuse. Tana and the other women 
wearily pick up the carcass and continue. completely exhausted and must pause again for rest. Angrily, the leader storms back and yells for them to get going. Bro! Bora! Me! The rebellious I... Tana tells him that the men should carry the dead animal. The infuriated, desperate Tana throws a rock at the leader, felling him. Tana immediately realizes that they must flee with the children, or the men of the tribe will take revenge on them. The women quickly gather the children and rush off into the jungle. The stunned leader orders the men to go after the women, but the women have eluded them. The wise old woman tells them how, as time passed, the tribe prospered under Tana's able leadership, and the little girls learned how to fend for themselves. They all learned the skills of hunting and fishing for their food. The child on shore, like all children are wont to do, decides to wander off and do a little exploring herself. The entire tribe is unaware that they have been sighted by the terrible Gwadi. This nine foot tall monster has roamed the jungle for years, bringing death and destruction to whatever he touches. Tana sees the little girl is missing and calls to the other women to follow her in search of the child. Savage, merciless, possessed of Herculean strength, Wadi is the most feared thing in the prehistoric world. The little girl explains to the wise one as best she can that she has seen the terrible giant. Wadi! Wadi! Ella! Ayla! Ayla! Gwadi has successfully captured two of the women and is carrying them off. Tana was the only one to get away, but has been mortally hurt and dies with Gwadi's name on her lips. Gwadi. The wise old woman flees with the children. Roddy! Even now, 15 years later, the mention of the dreaded name of Gwadi still strikes terror in the hearts of these same girls. They know that the hideous giant still ranges the jungle. The wise one tells them that they must forget their hatred of Anir, their word for men. The moon is full. By the time of the advent of the next full moon, they must find and capture themselves husbands if the tribe is to survive. And the next morning, the six determined women set forth on their mission, accompanied by one of their panthers.
This is the man of our story. He is Engor. This is Engor's friend, Ruik. This is Kama and the bearded Ud. Engor and his friends are on a foraging expedition. They're hunting food for their cave-dwelling tribe. They've cornered a savage tiger and are pitting their skill with stone-headed war clubs against this vicious monster of the jungle. And smelling the blood of a dead tiger, excitedly breaks away from the girls. They chase after their pet. Kala. uses the sap from a tree to soothe Angor's wounds. Suddenly, Ard falls unconscious. Angor and his tribesmen are amazed to see that they've been attacked by members of the weaker sex. Back on.
order the men to pick up the dead panther and carry him back to their camp. In the meantime, Angor stumbles along through the jungle back to his people. What type of women are these Ruig wonders who attack men and live in trees? Nika gazes at her captive, entranced by her first close look at a male.
cave is the home of Angor's tribe, and these are his people. They are mountain people, cave dwellers. Mela. Their leader looks skyward at a soaring vulture, knowing that where the vulture settles, they will find a wounded or dead animal. He motions for his hunters to follow him. Ra. find the wounded and exhausted Ingor and carry him back to the cave. mother and the rest of the cave dwellers crowd around the wounded Angor. His mother motions them to carry Angor into the cave where she can tend. Weeks have gone by and the leader of the cave dwellers is marking on the rocks the story of the women as Angor has told it to him. Time has healed Angor's wounds and despite the leader's protest, Angor is determined upon revenge. Angor. Gene. Angor vows to rescue his tribesmen and to bring back to this cave as slaves the women who captured them. Angor. Angor. Ela. Angor's mother, who knows of the women tribe, points out no, the right no. direction to Angor. Oro. She tells him he must cross Oro. two mountain ranges that it will take him two days' journey to reach the country of the women tribe. sense alive for the sound or sight of danger, Angor makes his way through the jungle toward the camp of the women. <laughs> Angor stumbles and loses his weapon cannot stop for it. He finally eludes the elephant by jumping behind a large boulder and the lumbering animal passes him by. <laughs> Having lost his only weapon, Angor must make a new club, his only protection against the many dangers lurking in the jungle. for the head of his club. 
He starts hacking two of them together to make a sharp edge. A spark ignites the dry leaves on the ground and Angor is taken aback by the strange unknown phenomenon, fire. He stretches his arm out to touch it and draws his hand back in pain. He doesn't understand it, but he knows that this new discovery of his has the power to inflict injury. fascinated by the wonder of the first torch. Pier, he calls it pier, his word for fire. The hiss of a python in the tree startles him to his feet. jabs the torch into the water after the snake. To his surprise, he finds the fire has disappeared. He jabs the torch back again, trying to regain the fire, but it's gone. Strangely enough, the swan dive was invented before the swan. Tigris jungle women have developed great skill in swimming, and it's one of their favorite recreations. On this night, Tigri, Eris, and Tule are enjoying an evening swim in this jungle pool. continues on his way. He is now approaching the outskirts of the jungle territory.
Suddenly, he sees ahead of him the huge, giant Guadi. Terrified, Angor decides that the tree is his best hiding place and quickly climbs up into it. Women were women in those days, too. A handsome male captive makes his appearance, and suddenly there's trouble. Angor! Angor! Rui! Angor! Angor! is not sure yet why she objects, but she wants no interference until she decides whether or not she herself wants him as her husband. Angor is 
tempted to strike back at his captor. But the ever-watchful, snarling panther is a warning for him to be careful. He decides that caution is better than tangling now with this strange band of women. of the camp asleep, Angor decides that this is his chance for escape. Quietly, he starts to climb down the vine. Now, ah, this is easy, Angor thinks. But he's not reckoned with the ever alert panther, who evidently has just been waiting for him. the women to feed their men. Arba decides that this is a good time for her to make up to Angor and starts to bring him some food. Sudden rage floods Tigri as she sees this. Arba. She angrily informs Arva that she has decided that Angor is to be her husband. Arva, I'm near. But Arva violently disagrees. Tigri, I'm near. And so the fight is on. 
Angor labors over a huge rock, which Tigre has ordered him to move. He can't budge it. Tigre shakes her head with the stupidity of men. Angor finally gives up, humiliated by her look of scorn. Gene, Elko. Lethal. He asks her if she is so wise and superior, why doesn't she see if she can move the rock? Tigri picks up a huge branch and using simple leverage, Shows anger how easy it is to move the rock if you use your head.
This is the night before the full moon. Time is running out for the male captives. By tomorrow, the marriage ceremonies will have been completed. The wise one drums, and the women dance as Angor and the men look on with mixed emotions. up their clubs and demonstrate that in their homes they will be the master. Surrounded by the watching women and the ever-guarding panther, the men sit idly while Ruig, who seems to have a fetish for being clean-shaven, is scraping his cheek with a sharp-edged stone. Suddenly, a tremendous black shadow sweeps over the camp. 
It is Korax, the flying dragon, the scourge of the skies. So the tables are turned. The dominant male is happy and contented. Women wait on him as though he were a king. at Angor's command is out gathering fruit. She's hungry and would like to eat some of the fruit, but no, Angor forbids it. The once proud, fiery leader of the tribe meekly obeys. Bro, Seiko.
He offers a piece of raw meat to Angor, who's intrigued by the scent of the meat in the fire. and he offers some to Kama and Tigri. At first, they refuse. When they taste it, they both agree that it is delicious. Hello. And so, for the first time, cooked meat goes on the menu of this primitive tribe, and civilization progresses another step. Angor's thoughts are of his home and his people. He gives orders that they will start on their long trek back to the mountain home of Angor's tribe. Tigri, Iko, Angor. Iko, Bora. Ela, Ela. Angor leads them through the jungle, ever alert for the lurking dangers which abound there. a natural cave off in the clearing and orders the group to rush toward it.
Then Gwadi decides to use his tremendous strength to topple over the huge rock, covering the top of the cave, so that it will crush the men and women inside. The giant stumbles away, howling with pain. Angor orders the other men to encircle the area with fires so they can forge a burning circle of death for Gwadi. the encircling fire and sees that his only escape is to go over it. looks with admiration at Angor. She asks him to change his mind and return to the women's camp with his men, where they can start a new tribe. Angor, Kiko Tigri. Eva. Angor, Kiko Tigri. Angor agrees and tells his friends he has decided to remain.
The wise old woman is happy as she sees the pairing off of the couples. She knows now there will be peace between the tribes and that the tribe will increase. She motions for Angor and Tigri to come to her. Ingo, Tigri, Gamos. She is going to perform the only kind of marriage ceremony she knows. With the blending of their blood, Angor and Tigri's marriage is completed. The first of four marriages to be celebrated that moonlit night as the women dance the marriage ceremonial to show their happiness. as today, the eternal battle for supremacy between woman and man was solved not through the clout and the club, but through romance.